like, come on in. And I'm glad you're here this morning at Walnut Creek Church of God. <clears throat> you all look great. Is it the Lord good this morning? Yes. Hallelujah. Looking forward to this morning. We have a great speaker this morning, Bishop Chad Fickett. Yes. <clears throat> so uh, we're going to enjoy the word. He's going to bring to the Lord. And uh, we're going to worship him this morning. We're going to give him praise this Amen. morning. Amen. Yes. For he's worthy of praise. It's so good to see you here. Uh, this morning, uh, the announcements, the Prime Timers Luncheon at 11.30 a.m. We want you to sign up. So make sure you sign up for that on February 20th, Prime Timers Luncheon. Uh, February 22nd, the Outreach Ministry is having a worship night at the Flying Squirrel Coffee Shop at 8 p.m. It's not in the bulletin, so 8 p.m. And uh, a few of us are going to be there. We're going to be worshiping the Lord, and you can come and join. So feel free to join from 8 to 9, 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. They close at 10. And that's on the Flying Squirrel on Main Street. Uh, February 23rd, membership name tag Sunday. Remember that? Uh, February 23rd, also Children's Ministry Mexican Food Fundraiser. Be ready for that. Be prepared to help the Children's Ministry and and purchase whatever they have. Uh, March 6th, the Arise Women's Event, 6.30 p.m. I think there's a sign up for that. And March 10th, the Elders Meeting at 7 p.m. March 28th, Churchwide Spring Cleaning. Churchwide Spring Cleaning. So you'll have a good time doing that if you join us. <laughs> All right. Let me read this morning. The scripture this morning is coming from 1 Samuel 17. Uh, verses 45 through 47. This is David dealing with uh, Goliath, if you're familiar with that story. So then David said to the Philistine, Goliath, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the, car give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. He will give you into our hands. Aren't you glad to know that our weapons are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Our God goes before us in the battle. We can stand and fight any giant, any battle. Aren't you glad about that? Yes. Give the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord. You're awesome. Join your prayer this morning. Hallelujah. Glory to his name. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you this morning. We thank you for being so loving. We thank you for your mercy and your grace, Lord. We thank you for salvation. Father, we're grateful to you, Lord. You are awesome. You're wonderful. Hallelujah. For you know everything and you're everywhere. You never change. And you have all power. Glory to your name. We can trust you and depend on you. Father, we ask that this morning that as your presence is here and we thank you for your presence, that lives will be changed. Salvations will happen. Deliverance. People will be encouraged and lifted up. And Satan will be stopped in this place. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen.
shall separate us. In Romans 8, it says, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Lord, I persuade you that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, yes. our Lord. Yes. There is no greater love that we can know or experience or have in the love that Christ Jesus has poured out for you this morning. The Savior of the Lord carried the cross for all of my days. He paid me the cost. Salvation
And we want to give you an opportunity to worship God and give you tithe and offering this morning. So as they begin to play, I'm going to ask you just to stand and come and worship God in your giving as you worship Him in tithe and offering. Very helpful um, in, in helping me as a young man. He wasn't old, but he was a little older than me. Um, and he'd been in ministry for a while. And he had just, he just really helped me. I would call him occasionally and say, you know, Brother Taylor, I need help. <laughs> I've never pastored before, but I've been on staff. And he, would, he was always kind, and I appreciate him. And we came to love uh, the Taylor family. And, uh, and, um, and it, it just great to have. Chad and Jennifer here in the state of Texas. They're doing a fantastic job ministering to our young people, as well as uh, serving uh, Bishop um, Toby and Diane Morgan with whatever they need. Because I know you're, you are a state and youth or, or a Christian education director, but your portfolio probably says the same as our youth pastor. And whatever the senior pastor or the state overseer needs you to do, you just step in and do because we're servants. Yeah, service heart. And we are so glad to have them with us. And this morning, uh, Brother Fickett has, Bishop Fickett has been here one other time yeah. and ministered to you and did a fantastic job. Uh, Sister Jennifer was not able to be with him. She has a beautiful voice, anointed to sing. And I asked, can she please sing? <laughs> and so she's going to come and minister in song to the Lord and bless you in singing and following her. Uh, Bishop Fickett will come and minister the word. Amen. Would you make her welcome? Good morning. It's so good to be with all of you this morning. I, I didn't miss out the last time. I was uh, in Kentucky at a women's conference that I had to go to. But I'm so glad that I'm able to be with all of you today. Oh, to him. 
I don't mean to chastise you, but when he said 50 years, there should have been a lot more cheering going on 50 years. Can somebody say, man, you've been here 50 years. And there you are. And he's been a lighthouse for 50 years. I'm from the Northeast. Can I tell you, there's a lot of lighthouses that haven't last past 50 years. And there's a lighthouse here in this town that's been shining the light of Jesus Christ for a long time. And somebody say amen for that. Amen. And being a part of the church of God, you, you tithe, you give tithe, and part of your tithe sometimes goes to help different ministries, like Pastor said today, to world missions. Uh, and I don't know if you want to tell who it is, but, but I know that because God put it on my heart to give to them too. It's a, it's a couple that ministers to the Samoans, uh, and they, they went out the other day, and their car just blew up. They had no way to transport themselves, to do work, to minister, to feed people. And God just put it on the heart of all of us to just give. And I believe God's going to cover the entire need. It was $15,000 we were trying to raise to uh, raise money for this van. I believe we've got to give to missions. Amen? Amen. And, uh, and so you've been doing that throughout the years. And I know that because YWA, which is a program that we celebrate in the youth department. Now, a lot of the times what happens in the church and what happens with us is we slide into the competitive mode. Somebody say amen. All of the men are acting like they're so spiritual right now. But if I got you on a basketball court and I hit you really hard down low, suddenly competition comes out of nowhere. Suddenly the spirit of competition take you out on the golf course and whoop you up real good. Suddenly you get a little red around the cheeks, acting, trying to be sanctified and spiritual. You're chewing your gum harder. The spirit of competition is all over you. We get a little competitive. Sometimes what happens in youth ministry, especially the Church of God, is we forget that these ministries were not created solely for competition. They were created for our young people to be discipled to do something with their money other than buy an Xbox. Amen. Many times what happens is we skip these things with our teenagers <laughs> in church, and then all of a sudden when they're 20 years old, we wonder why we can't convince anybody to give. Mm -hmm. You missed the point where they could have been discipled. So why did you it's not about the amount, it's about the spirit. It's about discipling our kids to give. And can I just say to you, we're going into this year, and why did we 2020? And Austin, you can just catch up with me on the slide. Is it working? Why did we 2020, piercing the darkness of Africa? <coughs> we have several orphanages in Africa. We're going to be helping several missions there. Uh, we get, we're going to send more. I'm bringing this project to you because last year, our project was Asia. And I just want to celebrate with you what God did through Texas. Texas out of all the other states in the Church of God, was number four in the top giving states in all of America. Somebody said it. Thank you, Lord, for that. you gave $67,000 to the Lord for world missions through YWA. Can somebody say praise the Lord? $67,000. So see, that doesn't mean much to some of you, but I was doing I stood up my coffee when I realized how much we gave because God is good. But over the years, go back, go back just a second. Look at that. Over the years, through the last five years, and when you look through 1962, since the inception of World Missions, Lamar Best, if you ever heard that name, Lamar Best had a vision for YWA that not only would we give to missions, but that some of these young people would see the project and become missionaries. Can we once again be the church of God full of the Holy Ghost where it doesn't just touch us, but it moves us to do something? Amen. And since 1962, Texas has believed in one day. Look at how much you've given. $1,465,246.07. I put the seven in there because it counts. Amen? <laughs> seven cents counts. Can you clap your finger on the back? Say good job. Somebody say good job in this place. I'm trying to tell you, I come from the state office, and sometimes you just see us when things are bad. I've come to say thank you for what you've done for what you have. You have made a difference. You say, well, I don't know what that means. I'll tell you what it means. It means simply this. A small effort here makes a big difference elsewhere. Amen. Did you hear what I said? Amen. A small effort here makes a large difference somewhere else. I know this because I traveled way a long time ago. It was back, do you remember the Ireland project? Ireland was our project. 
And I went over to visit the project after we had raised our money, and uh, we were in Canada at the time, and we raised $75,000, so that put us in a category where if we, we paid for our trip, we could go and see the project. We went, while we were there, we stopped in Belgium with Pastor Muzzabelli, which was a project years ago where we turned a brewery into a blessing. I almost messed that up. I almost said brewery. Uh, <laughs> Let's just say what it is. It was a beer factory, okay? <laughs> and God turned it into a Holy Ghost-filled lighthouse. Somebody yeah. say amen. Yeah. Belgium is full of sin. Everywhere you look, every street you go down, there's just something leading to something else. It's a beautiful city. It's full of sinners, though, like every city. And God put a church there. Not only did they build a church there, while I was standing in this beautiful edifice looking at this tabernacle that God turned out of a beer factory into something more, they, they proceeded to tell us not only have we done that, but we just built a hospital in the Congo of Africa. We just built a hospital over in Kenya. Your giving went to touch Belgium, but it went so much further. Another little story happened in Serbia. In Bosnia, excuse me, in Bosnia, we were ministering in an orphanage. We were raising money for an orphanage. And while David Blair was there, a man kept hounding him. He showed up. He showed up at the hotel one morning while David was eating breakfast. said, I need to talk to you. We need to talk to you. He showed and he, David said, I don't have time. I've got to go. We're on this trip. I got, I'm, he's tied. If you've ever been on a mission trip, you're tied to somebody else. Amen. You're going where they're going and, because you don't know where you're at. So you're following them. And uh, finally, after a few days, this man finally caught up with David, got his attention, and said, no, no, I need to talk to you. I need some money for a roof. And he said, roof? He said, yes, I need some money for a roof. What you don't understand is the money that you gave to us five years ago, we have sowed the seed so that we can get the interest off of it. And the interest we get off of it, we buy potatoes. And we store the potatoes in this factory with which we feed the entire three villages around us. And the orphanage, the, the, the wind blew the roof off the other day. And if we don't get the roof back on, the rain said, did you hear what I just said? We gave money through one of the eight and don't even know that we've been feeding people for years. So when Pastor comes to you, and I don't know when he will, I want you to see this project. I'm, I'm going to ask him to show the video. I am going to preach. For those of you thinking, oh, Lord, this is what I've, I've you settled in. You're looking at me. Do uh, you think I'm about to sell a Marriott timeshare that you'll never get out of? Uh, you know that's not true. So open your Bibles to Acts chapter 13. But check out this video really quick for one of the day. Go ahead, Austin. called the Dark Continent. For Christians, this name comes from the spiritual darkness of Islam, voodoo, and ancestral worship, which pervades the region. YWEA 2020 seeks to pierce this darkness with the light of Jesus. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The revival has already started. Every day, more than 30,000 Africans come to Christ. Now, there is an urgent need for ministry training centers to equip pastors, youth and children's leaders, church planters, and teachers. YWEA 2020 will partner with the World Mission Send the Light Initiative and target the cities of Lome and Lusaka, Zambia. Lome is Togo's industrial center, but it suffers immense poverty. There is a great need for trained ministers, and Lome is strategically situated to meet that need throughout West Africa. YWEA has helped plant hundreds of churches in the region, but pastors and ministry leaders, especially youth and children's ministers, are still in short supply. YWEA 2020 will help build a ministry training center in Lome to serve the entire region of West Africa. This facility will house the Frank of Home Bible Training School for fresh speaking church leaders. Along with classrooms, the center will also include overnight accommodations, a cafeteria, and a conference center. The 2020 initiative will also modernize the Berea Theological College in Lusaka, Zambia. 
which provides an industry training and education for Central Africa. One of the property's older buildings will be completely renovated and transformed into a city church to serve as the ministry headquarters and church planning training center for the region and to house offices for the National Youth Ministry. In keeping with YWEA's mission and vision, the 2020 project will also care for orphans across the continent. Throughout Africa, orphaned and abandoned children are extremely vulnerable to dangers such as trafficking, child labor, and recruitment as child soldiers. YWEA partners with Church of God World Missions to help support over 1,700 children in orphanages in Kenya, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Liberia, Tanzania, Uganda, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. The Jeremiah Generation needs your help to fulfill the 2020 vision in Togo and Zambia and to continue rescuing and caring for orphans across Africa. The light of the gospel is piercing spiritual darkness across Africa. And you can be a part of this movement by joining the YWEA 2020 vision. Support it today by giving to your local church or going to myywea.com. Together, we can send the light to Africa. So that's our YWEA project for 2020. A couple things that I want to explain to you. You know, you talked about I do whatever the bishop asks. That's actually been passed by the General Assembly. It's actually written in the minutes that I serve at the request of the state overseer, which is a joy with Toby and Diane Morgan. They're fantastic to serve with. But also something else that was written and passed a few years ago uh, was this. Every dime that is raised for YWA, 100%, it's in our assembly minutes. We cannot violate the minutes or we can be sued. Did you hear what I said? 100% of everything that is raised for YWA goes straight to the project. Nothing stops here in America. It goes straight to the project. So I just wanted you to know that, so when you give, you feel confident that you can give to something worthy. I want to celebrate a few other things here, and, and just go to that next uh, slide with our, our Run for Hope. Another thing we do throughout the year, how do we have any runners in the place today? Uh, any joggers? Any fast walkers? Somebody. Okay, all right, all the fast walkers, let me see your hand. I, I, I've gotten into, I'm, I'm working, I've, I've let myself go since I've been to Texas a few years back. I lost 60 pounds, and then I found out what true brisket really tastes like, and uh, I put on the weight. But yesterday I went out, and I'm trying to get myself back in gear because we have a run for hope coming up in May. And I'm pleased to tell you that last year, Texas was number one in raising money for orphans. Now, the orphans that we have around the world, the orphanages we started, somebody came back and said, hey, who's feeding these kids? We built the orphanage, but now who's feeding them? And so what we, what we do is we have a race. Now, you don't have to come and run. You can walk. Uh, I had a brother one year, and don't tell me you can't because I had a brother one year showed up with his walker. And he walked a mile and back and raised almost $300 by himself. I mean, it was great to, to see the support of it. But come on out. We we're going to have a race up here in Weatherford. It's going to be just down the road from our campground. And uh, run, walk, crawl, roll, whatever you want to do. Uh, just show up. We will have medics on hand for anyone that needs oxygen, uh, including me. And another thing, right around the corner, same thing with YWA. Junior talent is not just a competition. Junior talent is so our churches who have no music can find kids that do music and let them do the music. Somebody say amen. amen. Uh, that one frustrates me a lot. I see kids that went teen talent and I show up at the person's church and it's awful when I have to listen to it. Uh, anyways, uh, this being live stream, I should have said that. Uh, go back. <laughs> Uh, th yeah. Okay, so Run for Hope, Junior Town, if you want to come see some kids play some great music, come around. Any golfers in the house? Anybody that plays golf? Vanya, my brother and my sister, we're going to have a golf tournament that will help the YWA tournament right around the corner. Let's go very quickly. Just look at what God did through your giving, through your church supporting. Look at what God did at youth camp. Can we show that? Look. Texas Church of God Senior Camp, we saw 40, 39 kids give their life to Jesus Christ for the first time. We saw 39 baptized in water, 129 recommitted their lives to Jesus Christ. 94 kids were filled with the Holy Spirit. 79 were called into ministry. They didn't stop there. We went to preteen. There were 31 saved, 
63 recommitted, 45 sanctified. See, in the church of God, we still believe in that. 18 filled, 27 were called into ministry. And then we went to junior camp. Look at what God did there. 31 saved, 63 recommitted, 45 saved, 18 filled, 27 called. God showed up at our youth camps and the Holy Spirit moved and God was something amazing. So, with that being said, I want you to stand. Don't forget, youth camp, it's right around the corner. We'll be here before you know it. Stand with me. Go to Acts chapter 13. Look at your neighbor and say, that was, that was rather painless. Um, I have a timer up here, so I'll be careful not to uh, waste your time. But I wanted you to show a lot of the times the Church of God's that support, that come out in our heart, are not told what God is doing through your faithfulness, and it's through your faithfulness, Church of God members, that we're able to do what we do. So I want to say thank you. Today, if I can, I want to talk to you very quickly about the cities of David, the six cities of David, Acts chapter 13, verse 21. Then they requested a king. Now this is Saul, formerly known as Saul of Tarsus. Now Saul has been converted. God has saved him and redeemed and filled him with the Holy Spirit, and now he begins to expound. Isn't it amazing what God will do through a reprobate who was seeking people to destroy? Paul, at one time, was actually persecuting and killing Christians. And now here he is. He's defending Christians. He's giving us scripture here. And he says, then they requested. He's going through the history of Israel. Then he says, they requested a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. When he had removed him, he raised up David to be the king of whom he testified, saying, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will fulfill my entire will. Would you pray with me? Lord, bless this time together. Thank you for the time that you've allowed me to be here. Father, I am just a man. I am nothing important, nothing special. But God, when your word comes forth. Let your anointing speak through us today. And let somebody know, God, that you're working while they're waiting. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Before you see it, look at two people and say, he's working while you're waiting. He's working while you're waiting. You know, waiting is never easy. How many of you know that today? How many of Amazon Prime? Now, people first. People think it's the mark of the beast and the antichrist. I happen to enjoy it, so I don't know what that means. Uh, I, I, I like to order something and know it's at my doorstep tomorrow. Amen? Uh, and uh, how many of you, though, we get, we're get we so caught up with fast food, Starbucks mobile order. Uh, I mean, it's like having servants, right, that we really don't have to pay the tax on. It's like... It's like the old English banner and just ringing the bell downstairs and saying, I would like my tea. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit like that. And when we go to Starbucks, we get a mobile order done first. We walk in and it's wrong. How many of you know how irritated are we when it's wrong? Oh, you're a bunch of saved people. You know what I'm talking about. You're irritated when it's wrong. That's your morning. Get it going. Juice, that's what you need. And we get caught up so much because Americans, we have it good. Everything we want is right around the corner. <coughs> Waiting is not something we like to do. Thank you, brother. One person came to <laughs> this morning. Especially men. We don't like to wait. We don't want to wait on anything. Get it done now. Somebody in this room say amen. amen. And help me preach this like I'm not the only one that has trouble with being patient sometimes. <laughs> We don't like to wait. But I come out and tell some of you, God is always working while we're waiting. He's always working while we're waiting. Waiting is frustrating to us as Americans. We, we went on that trip to Scotland to, to do missions. And on the way back, I found these mints that I loved. Oh, man, these mints were great. It's pathetic, isn't it? Just the, how I sound this morning. But I love these little mints. And I said, honey, can you see? The, she ordered those mints. Guess what? Two days later. Those bits were on our doorstop here in Weatherford, Texas. I thought this is crazy. That is, we're conditioned as Christian Americans not to wait. We don't wait in prayer. You call a prayer meeting, it's the easiest way to, to decide whether or not you need to start a new church because you have an empty building. You call a prayer meeting, people don't show up. You ask people to wait in the altars. 
And when something doesn't happen like we want it to happen or when we want it to happen, we leave. We hurry through worship because everybody's got to get somewhere. And I'm not beating us up today. I'm just trying to help us understand we've conditioned ourselves sometimes to the point that we've removed ourselves from the miracles God wants to do through each of us because we refuse to wait. I came across this story, and I hope you like funny stories. If you haven't, you've got the wrong preacher. <laughs> Those of you here with me last time know I like things that are funny. A very old man dying in his bed on death's doorway. Now, that's not funny. Please don't write my bishop over it. He suddenly smelled the aroma of his favorite chocolate chip cook cookies waving up the stairs. He gathered his remaining strength, lifted himself out of bed, leaning against the wall. He slowly made his way out of the bedroom and with even greater effort forced himself down the stairs. Gripping the railing with both hands, with labored breath, he leaned against the door frame, gazing into the kitchen. And were it not for death's agony, he would have thought himself already in heaven. Spread out on newspapers on the kitchen table were hundreds of his favorite chocolate chip cookies. Was it heaven? Or was it one final act of a heroic love from his devoted wife seeing to it that he left this world a happy man? <laughs> Mustering one great final effort, he threw himself towards the table. The aged withered hand shaking made its way to the cookie at the edge of the table when suddenly he was smacked by a spatula and his wife screamed, Stay out of those, they're for the funeral. Waiting, <laughs> oh, no. waiting is uncomfortable. <laughs> Waiting can get us in trouble. And some of you don't know. That's, I don't know. Is that funny? Can I laugh at that? I'll go ahead and laugh at that. I didn't even give you a name of the old man, but I don't know if the old man's real. It's just a funny illustration about waiting. Waiting's never easy. And you think about David, who we're talking about, who, who Paul is preaching about. David was anointed a king as a teenager. But was almost a middle-aged man before he ever had the throne. You see, sometimes, especially, sometimes it's, we're Pentecostal believers, the Spirit of God moves us, and we're so conditioned to the fact that when the Spirit of God moves, He can do things really cool. Amen? Amen? And we get used to it and forget that sometimes living a life with God is a journey. There's a journey through things. So I want to take you really quick through this journey with David and see if we can relate some of the nuggets to ourselves. The first city that we look at in the six cities of David, the beginning of his journey, it was at Bethlehem. 1 Samuel 16, 4, Samuel did that which the Lord spoke, came to Bethlehem, and the Bible says David was anointed at Bethlehem. What are the lessons that David had to learn at Bethlehem that we can learn for ourselves? See, Bethlehem is where David was born. It was a small farming town. Like many of us, have you ever noticed when athletes tell a story and movie stars tell a story, they always tell you about their humble beginning and how horrible it was, and they were born out of this. And if you listen to anybody long enough, they'll tell you how horrible it was. How, well, I was, born, I was born in Bangor, Maine. I was raised up in Exeter, Maine, on my grandfather's dairy farm. All I ever knew was the smell of agriculture. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Never dreamed of being a youth director in the great state of Texas. Never dreamed that God, you see how quickly and how easy it is for us to tell the stories of our beginning. But the question is not just your story. I find a lot of people can tell the story about their beginning, but they can't tell you the lessons they should have learned at the beginning. They want to skip the beginning. Zechariah 4.10 encourages us, do not despise small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Isn't that amazing? God is as happy about seeing the work begin as he is about seeing something finished. Amen. Humble beginnings are stuff that we like to write out of our books. We don't want people to know certain parts of our life. We try to hide those facts. I don't. Because those humble beginnings show me the grace of God throughout my journey. We like to sit in a pulpit today, and I, and, and I apologize. I'm a little fired up at more conference. God did something in me. There was a sweet, 
sweet spirit there. It was almost like the humbling power of the Holy Spirit just came in and knocked all of us on the floor. And I'm sure everyone from Texas was like, man, this youth director is weird because all I could do was cry. I just felt his presence so strong. Because there's something about getting into his presence that reminds you that, 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 that he brought you out. That he started you on this journey. That you're nothing special without his anointing. That you're nothing special without his touch. That you're nothing special without his power. It's all it's only through his anointing that you can preach the word. It's only through his anointing that you can understand the word. It's only through his precious spirit that gifts can flow out of you. It's only because he sits on the throne and intercedes for me every day that I don't wake up to another failure upon failure upon failure. It reminds me of how humble I am in his presence and I have to go back to the beginning. We don't like humble beginnings. We turn on our lights today and we expect them to work. Yep. And it freaks us out when they don't. But did you know the first electric light was so dim that a candle was needed to see it soft? Right. <laughs> How about this? One of the first steamboats took 32 hours to chug its way from New York to Avon, New York, a distance of 150 miles. Wilbur and Orville Wright's first airplane flight lasted only 12 seconds. It was always funny. We celebrate the Wright brothers as heroes, but I never hear anybody say, I would have wanted to ride with them. <laughs> the first automobile, all of you got in your car, you drove over here today, you're like me, you backed in your truck because it's got a camera. <laughs> the first automobile, though, traveled two to four miles per hour, broke down all the time, and people with horse and buggies would pass them on the street screaming, get a horse! <laughs> we sometimes take for granted the beginning. David was here at the beginning. You, you might want to write this down. You've got to learn to be faithful in the natural before the spiritual comes through. Oh, people don't like this kind of preaching, but I'm going to dig in here because this... This is in the church today, and it irritates me. You think because you have a divine revelation from God, you don't have to be faithful in tithes. You don't have to be faithful in church attendance. You don't have to be faithful in praying and reading your word. God has called you, so suddenly you've got a revelation, and you're special, and everyone needs to wait on you, but that's not true. You've got to be faithful in the natural, and then the spiritual falls into that. Jesus didn't go to John at the Jordan and say, baptize me because I just want to do it. It feels good. No, Jesus, when Paul, when, oh, excuse me, when John the Baptist said, no, you should be baptizing me, he said, no, you do this for this is right to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus taught us a lesson that sometimes you have to do what is right in the physical so that the spiritual will come on behind you. Well, I'm preaching to somebody right now. But today's church, we want the miracle without the sacrifice. We want the glory without the sacrifice. Somebody write this down. The journey to your highest destination starts with your smallest responsibility. I remember I worked for a pastor one time. I won't tell you who, but when I was younger, young man, felt the call of God. I had to learn this lesson hard because I thought, oh, I'm, I'm 15. I, I should be speaking at a... Times Square, I should be uh, Brooklyn Tabernacle. How come they haven't invited me yet? I mean, I am good. And uh, I remember going to work for this pastor, and the pastor would get, like, he was one of those guys. The seats had to be lined up straight. Anybody say amen. <laughs> and that front row right there would drive him nuts. He'd have to pray through. Uh, I'm telling you. And I, and I remember one time I went in, I tried to line the chairs up, and how many know what happened? It wasn't good enough. He came behind me, lined the chairs up. And you know what? This went on. But you know what? I decided, you know what? He asked me to do this. I'm going to keep being faithful. And I made it an exercise. Every hand that went on every chair began to say, Father, touch whoever sits in this seat. Lord, bless them. And as I went through, I turned it into a prayer exercise. You know what? Today, sometimes at youth camp, before the kids even get there, I find myself going through the chairs and just straightening them and touching them. Say, Lord, touch why? Because something started in the beginning, and it trained me. It trained me. I got trained at the beginning. Amen. Jesus said he was faithful, and what is least will also be faithful in much. We're expecting people who 
who aren't faithful in anything to be faithful in much in the church. And then we're shocked when they drop the ball. I love the second part of that verse. Look it up, Luke 16, 10. And he who is dishonest in the least is also dishonest in much. You say, what does this have to do with David in the beginning? Look at it. And Malcolm Gladwell has a great book called The Tipping Point. And in it, he talks about people who learn their trade. And he even uses David, excuse me, he uses David. And he tells us that it takes over 10,000 hours to master a subject. Piano, guitar, drums, whatever it is, to master it. David learned in Bethlehem to be a worshiper and to be a warrior. David learned to play the harp. If David hadn't learned to play the harp, they never would have called him. When the demons were tormenting Saul the king and bring him in there and let him play the harp so that the demons would flee. If David hadn't learned how to be a warrior against the bear and the lion, you know the rest of the story. He became a shepherd, which is the greatest example of how to lead people. He learned at the beginning. You know what else he learned? He learned how to handle rejection. He learned how to handle rejection. He's out here tending sheep and bear, and they're having an anointing party down here. And Samuel had told Jesse, bring to me all of your sons. But for some reason, Jesse didn't think David was quite up to the task. How many of you know that was a nice Christmas dinner that year? <laughs> you say, how does that, what does that bring us? Brings us, brings me to the next city, Gibeah. Look at it, Gibeah in 1 Samuel 16, 21. David came to Saul and stood before him. And he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. So God takes David out of Bethlehem, brings him to Gibeah, and now all of a sudden David is exposed to what it means to be royalty. See, some of us want to just take the reins of whatever God wants to do through us, and yet we still don't have a firm understanding of what he is actually doing. David got a first-hand lesson of what it was like to be around royalty, of how a servant should answer the king. Of how to carry yourself when I became. Can I tell you also something else? He learned how to be faithful. He was faithful with an early promotion. David never once allowed the applause of men to interfere with him being a servant. And in today's church, can I just preach this a little bit? I hope that one day we'll get back to taking the towel like Jesus did. And we'll say, I know you've talked bad about me. I know you betrayed me, Judas, but I'm just going to wash your feet. I'm just going to get down here and wash your feet. We've got so many people with titles and powers and positions. What we need is a few more servants in the church today. People who are ready to serve. People who haven't said, I've come too far to do that. That's not my job anymore. I still hate seeing trash in the parking lot. I still hate seeing trash on the carpet. I don't call Jay our maintenance man. I go over and pick it up and I put it in the trash. Why? Because we've never come that far that we can't still be a servant. The other thing you learn is God's working while I'm waiting. Don't you think that David got to give you? He's sitting in the palace and he said, this is it. This is it. I can still smell the anointing oil. I can still smell. I still remember Word for word, everything that the prophet Samuel said, you shall be king over Israel. I still, this is it. I'm in the palace. This has got to be it. God has got, have you ever had that feeling in your life? Yeah. This is it. God's doing it. It's happening. It's going to happen. And then all of a sudden, it all gets turned upside down. Mm -hmm. The third city, and I'm hurrying the third city. Listen to this. He said, this is the battle of Elah. Elah is the city of transition. 1 Samuel 17, 57. Then as David returned from the slaughter of Philistine, Abner took him, brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? So David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse the Bethlehemite. Here's some lessons to learn while you're in Elah. The valley of Elah is where David faced the giant. The valley of Elah, and the lessons to learn there is don't back off. Mm. Oh, somebody hear me today. Some of you, God has taught you how to pray. 
He's filled you with the Spirit. He's taught you how to be a leader. And sometimes you've been in your prayer room and you have a little doubt that creeps in there and you back off. No, my friend, that is a Goliath. That is a giant trying to keep you from praying through, whether it's someone else's victory or your own. And I've come by to tell some of you, don't you ever forget that you at one time took a little pebble and stuck it in a sling, and you took down a bear, and you took down a lion. Don't you ever be afraid of Goliaths in your life. You walk up to them like David did, and David said, today, God will deliver you into my hands. Who are you that you should come against God Almighty? When you get to Eli, don't back off. Some of us get to Eli in our Elas of the moments where God is saying, this is it, you're transitioning. You're not quite there yet, but you're transitioning. Now it's time for you to put to, put to use the things I taught you. But the moment you end up in Eli and cops and conflicts all around you and the enemies all around you, is you get a little discouraged. You feel that moment in your heart, you start to think, what if this doesn't work? What if God doesn't come through? And all of a sudden you back up. I've got news for you. We're losing generations because people who know how to pray have backed up. We're losing generations because people who know the word have stopped preaching the word. We're losing generations because people who know how to carry the worship have stopped carrying the word. Somebody help me today. Fight the Goliath in your life. Face him down and say, I'm coming against you today in the name of Jesus Christ Almighty. David showed absolute confidence in the power of God. I'm more confident in Sister Rowan's piano playing than I am mine. <laughs> you know what would happen if I went back there? I would play what Auntie Prue, that's what we call her. You can say Auntie Prue down here. Auntie Prue, we sit at the keyboard. I go, dee, 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 dee. That's all I ever learned. I got no confidence back there. More confidence in her. You see, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to tell you, hasn't God done miracles in your life before? I'm trying to tell you, haven't, heard, haven't you heard about the God who split the Red Sea? I'm trying to tell some of you, haven't you heard about God when he hung on a cross and they put him in the ground and three days later he conquered death out of the grave? I'm trying to tell you about a God who had a bunch of disciples who were lost and felt rejected, but Jesus came walking through walls to get to them. I'm telling you about a God with which nothing is. So have confidence in your God today. Have faith. Don't yield to fear. And look at your neighbor and say it. Remember this. He's working. He's working while you're waiting. I can't you see it? Can't you see it? David was anointed to be king. He sat in the palace. He thought, this is it. I'm the king. This is it. Look, it's here. God just... Just slide Saul over and just pop me in that throne and I'll be king. <laughs> that didn't happen. Then he goes out and he kills Goliath. And suddenly they start singing, the ladies of Israel. You know, you ladies can get us men in all kinds of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> the ladies of Israel start singing, Saul has slain his thousand, but David his tens of thousands. And you can hear it reverberate off the rocks and the walls all over Israel. And David might have thought to himself, this is it. I've killed the greatest enemy Israel's ever known. I've killed the life while the rest of them were afraid. This is it. I'm going to be king. But guess what God says? No. Nope. I'm preaching today. Some of you don't like it, but that's all right. Because you're tired of waiting. You've been waiting on a miracle. You've been waiting on a financial breakthrough. You've been waiting for God to revive your heart again. And you keep waiting, thinking this is it. If I can just get to spring, God will do something. If I can just get to camp meeting, God will touch my heart and change it. If I can just get here. But don't you love a God that doesn't show up when we expect him to? He shows up out of the blue, out of nowhere suddenly, in a place where we think he can't move, in a place where he thinks everything's dead, everything's dry. He goes to the cave of Gabelon, which is the next city. The cave of 
Bedouin is what I like to call the city of leadership development. First Samuel 22, 1 David therefore departed from there and escaped to the kingdom of Bedouin. So when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. After escaping the clutches of the enemy of the Philistine king, David flees to the cave of Adon. It's a place of safety. Here is where he takes time to recover and think. Can you imagine what he's thinking? What just happened? I've been faithful. You promoted me from Bethlehem to Gibeah. I fought Goliath and Elah. But now I'm sitting in this cave and I've lost my job. I lost my wife. I find it, if I ever read that story, you don't see anywhere about wife and wife. She's not leaving the palace to build the caves. <laughs> you get a true sense of this despair. Open your Bible, Psalms 142. We got time. Look, see, y'all don't believe me, but I'm, I'm looking at it, okay? You get home to watch the XFL, whatever you want to watch today, the PGA Tour. It'll happen for you. But for those of you that are hungry, look at this. Psalms 142. This is David's prayer. This is the actual prayer he wrote in the cave. A prayer when he was in the cave. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. With my voice unto the Lord, I make supplication. I poured out my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble when my spirit was overwhelmed within me. Thou knewest my path in the way wherein I walked. Have they privily laid a stair for me? I looked on. I love churchy people who are spiritual. Say, no, you can't talk to God like that. Yes, I can't talk to God like that. Right. Look at David. Look at what he's telling me. He said, God, don't you see everything I'm going through here? Has anybody in this room been in that place? Have you ever been to the hospital and know that sense of despair? God, what are you doing? This doesn't line up with your word for me. This doesn't line up with that dream. This doesn't line up with all that I've got written down. God, what are you doing? Amen. He said that there was no man that would know me. He's lonely. Shocking in the church how many good Christian people live their lives alone. No man cared for my soul. I cried unto thee, O Lord. I said, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. Attend unto my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they're stronger than me. Bring my soul out of prison that I may praise thy name. The righteousness shall compass me about, for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. What do we learn from David out of hell? We learn to be faithful when we don't understand. Amen. I'm just going to stop and praise him for a minute. Oh, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We love our soul to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We love our soul to the Lord. Because there's somebody in this room, I know it. There's somebody in every church. There's somebody in every walk of life. If you're a believer, you've been in this moment. You've been here where you're looking up to God and you say, God, I don't understand. Death wasn't a part of it. You didn't tell me they were going to die. Oh, my soul, now I'm preaching this to somebody Amen. this morning. God, I don't understand cancer had enough. This wasn't supposed to be part of the plan. God, diabetes, that wasn't to be part of the plan. Lord, I don't know what you're doing. Where are you? Oh, somebody help me preach this morning. David is in the cave. You see, the cave is the battle you fight after you win. The cave is what you all make fun of us preachers about because on Monday morning, we come from this moment where God is moving, the Spirit is moving, and on Monday morning, we've got to get up and act normal again. Right. <laughs> and every Monday, we've got this little cave we've got to walk through. All right. This little cave we've got to go through. We've got to get up and go back to work. The cave is the battle you fight after what David's behavior says this. Oh, I love this. And I'm, I'm, I'm being blessed all myself up here this morning. I apologize. I should be more eloquent than right. this. But God is blessing me through this today because sometimes what we, what we forget is that sometimes surrender is not just the first act of our work with God. It's the entire act of our work with God. Oh, somebody hear me. Surrender is not the first act. It's the entire act. Because David says, I only serve the Lord. It's not about me. See, he has an opportunity to kill Saul. Saul's right there. I can kill him. I can end this. I can take the throne. But 
David so says it's not about me getting even or killing Saul. But it's about winning the battle of faithfulness. Oh, if I was you, I'd write it down in my Bibles. Lord, help me win the battle of faithfulness. Amen. The battle of faithfulness. See, we get caught up with fighting demons, and we get caught up with fighting darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. But sometimes the greatest battle in our lives is just being faithful. It's just getting up in the morning and saying, God, I don't feel too good today, but I trust you. I love you. I bless your name. I worship you. Go to church on Wednesday night. Go to church on Sunday. Go to church sometimes. Listen, all you spiritual people don't get this, but sometimes driving through traffic, you don't feel that saved, but you show up at church anyway, and you say, God, I trust you. I, I trust you in all things. See, I've been there. I've been there. We went through this time with my stepdad. For eight years, he battled cancer. Every spring, they would call us in and say, he's dead. He's going to die, and he'd make a rebound, and we did that for seven and a half years. Do you know what that does to you as a preacher? Jen and I are in Laurel, Maryland. We're digging out this church that's been closed for three months. Beautiful people there. The, the, the title of the name was Trinity International Community Church of God. We showed up and it was her and I. And I looked at her and said, there's nothing international about us. We changed it to living hope. Yeah. First Peter, blesses the Lord and God our Father Jesus Christ who has born us again to a living hope. And we started preaching, but the whole time we were playing in the church, I was burying the dead. The whole time we were playing in church, I was calling my mom, Mom, you okay? You get through this? Every year, he just about died, but he made this rebound. I know what it is to go into church and raise my head and say, no, where are you? I preach this gospel. I see people get healed and touched, but God, show up and heal in my family. But I've learned through the years that the battle that I'm fighting is the battle of faithfulness. And I've learned to become just so determined. Uh, uh, where I'm from, we've got staunchy old lobstermen. They're old fishermen, and they're tough. And they're tough. And if you think you're going to look at a 75-year-old man on Swan's Island, and you think you're going to move him, you better think again. That guy's been pulling traps all of his life. He's a bit strong. And when those boys say, nope, you're not moving me, I'm going to stay right here. They're going to stand their ground. I want that kind of faithfulness with God. When the devil just gives up. Anybody want the devil at some point to just give up? Because he's learned his lesson. I'm going to be faithful for I am committed. I am believed and persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Do you hear me? Sometimes the battle is faithfulness. He learns and he, he learns at the cave also to serve him in the process. This is our calling. This is our giftedness to God. And I don't know who this is for, but the Spirit, look at the Lord, just kind of the Lord, I'm not wanting to do this much. But as I was sitting over there, I had this heavy impression that the Holy Spirit wanted me to tell some of you, you haven't yet discovered the gifts that God wants to use through you. You think you're just a singer. You think you're just someone that speaks in tongues and interprets every once in a while. But God sent me by to tell some of you there's gifts in you that you haven't even developed yet. You're not even at the right city yet. He's got more for you. And 50 years is nothing compared to what God wants to do for the next 50 years. And we've got to keep pressing. And we've got to serve him in the process. Amen. Some of us get our gift and we get our calling and then when things don't go our way. See what You think I'm going to do that, God? You, you think after what you did, I'm going to do that? Some of you think, well, you're being awful mean. Now I'm, I'm preaching my testimony. My wife's over there, and I'm she already knows. I'm, I, I was 14 years old, watched my dad die. He was my pastor. He was my leader. He was going to take me into my ministry. He was going to develop me. And all of a sudden, I took my gift in this one morning. When we found out that he was dead, and I threw it at the Lord's feet and said, do you think I'm going to do that after you did this? I walked away from him for a little bit, but how many of you know he never walks away from us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember that day, I remember that very morning when I got on my knees and felt the spirit move again in my life. What he was saying is, listen, you've got to learn to be faithful. 
Life comes and goes. Life is hard. The Bible tells us don't believe what TV preachers tell you. It rains on the just and the unjust. We've got to learn to be faithful with what he calls us to do. Well, you don't believe that, but God told Noah to build an ark. Noah built an ark. He was faithful. And did you know that he waited 100 years for it to rain something he had never seen with his own eyes? Abraham was called of God to father a great nation. It took many years, many experiences before he learned to discipline himself and wait on God. He learned that God would keep his promise. And he's up on the mountain. He's about to take his son Isaac and lay him on that throne and, and sacrifice him. And some people say, well, that was barbaric. No, if you don't understand what he was saying to God was, and if you read it out, what he's saying is, if you call me to kill him, I trust you to resurrect him. Oh, somebody help me right now. See, what happens sometimes is God takes our dreams. He takes everything that we thought he was building us to, and suddenly we're stuck in a cave, and we don't know what God is doing. It's as though somebody's turned out the lights. He's teaching us to be faithful. I've got to hurry. Somebody said amen. I heard it for you. I heard it for you. <laughs> David said, David learned. You can read Psalms and learn that David learned. And God was working while he was waiting. But now, O oh Lord, upon what am I relying? You are my only hope. Psalms 39 7. Have you ever got to that place where you said it to him? Lord, I can't rely on I can't the doctors, I can't rely on them, I can't rely on anything going on. You're my only hope. Very quickly, the other thing that David learned was don't lose your joy in the cave. Mm -hmm. See, I come from one of those families where we've had a lot happen to us. And we've learned to laugh at funerals. <laughs> See, some of you just saw us. I mean, you walk through the valley, we've walked through. And we'll give you some tips on how to keep your joy. That's right. right. Because when you're standing at the casket of a loved one, it hurts, yes. yes. But when you know that they're sitting at the feet of Jesus, yes. they're yes. Yes. He learned to be faithful. I'm almost done. The city of Hebron. This, this city is powerful because it's called the city of almost death. Almost death. 2 Samuel 2, 1, look at it. It happened after this that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, Go up. David said, Where shall I go up? And he said to Hebron. Now, if you go over there and you study that, David's at Hebron. He's got a good look at Zion and Israel. He sees Jerusalem. It's the prize. God's brought me here to take it. But as you study the scripture a little bit more, David asked the Lord, should I go take it? And the Lord says, no. Doesn't God just make you mad sometimes? <laughs> really? Oh, you're very spiritual people in this place this morning. I've had a few moments where I've had some conversations with the Lord. And uh, I would want them recorded to save my life. You brought me here, Lord. I'm looking at the city. You told me I'd be king. There is no king over it. But what God was setting up was even more beautiful than what David had ever imagined. You see, when I was in Bible college, I remember I loved basketball. The NBA. I'm going to date myself here because that's what you do when you get old. I loved Larry Bird. I loved the Boston Celtics. Oh, I was 14, I learned to dribble through my legs. I learned to sit and slap a ball so I could get it to a dribble without even bouncing it. I learned how to roll it down my arms. I learned every trick shot there was in the book. I wanted to play professional basketball. I loved that Robert Parrish would throw down and have a fit fist fight uh, underneath the backboard. I, I loved it all so much I went out and bought Larry Bird's book. That's all right. You can laugh, but I had dreams. He, he, I went out and bought Larry Bird's book, and Larry Bird, his whole first chapter is pass, dribble, shoot. Pass, dribble, shoot. If you study Larry Bird, he never took the ball unless the plan was drawn up like that and just shot it, unless it was a game-winning shot they needed. If it was the regular part of the game, he would pass, 
dribble, shoot. He never shot the ball without passing it first. That ain't in the NBA anymore. <laughs> and so when I went to Bible college, I wanted to be on the basketball team. And Austin, I was surrounded by a bunch of skinny winnies. <laughs> it all needed Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. How many ladies know when you're at the gym class, the woman who knows how to do every exercise next to you and does it without breaking a sweat, she needs Jesus. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, but I remember, I remember my first workout session in basketball. The coach said, all right, give me 120 laps. What? <laughs> Are we going to learn a drill here? Are we gonna... I need 120 laps. Now get on it. Sing it. Oh, oh, okay. And then you start running. I was okay. Number 10 kicked in. When number 10 kicked in, I said, Lord, you've called me to preach. Suddenly I feel the call of preaching on my way. So much more stronger than I did before. And then, and then how many of you love know these people that fat shame you while you're running? <laughs> Come on, it's okay to laugh. You know they do. They fat shame you while they're running. You know, I've got that little trail behind my house. I run that trail, and every once in a while I get that one person on that. Look at you. <laughs> you're doing it. <laughs> I hope you trip. Anyways, <laughs> I had those guys on this basketball team. <laughs> They run by me, they slap me in the back. You got it, kick it! Come on, just come away from me right now. <laughs> but I get, I get to about lap 50. I think I was going to make it, but my coach was saying, You're almost there, kick it! Almost there, halfway, keep going! Then I, then I run off another 20, thinking the blood filling up in my shoes and <laughs> sweating, I'm going to die here, I know it. But then after a while, after a few weeks of running, I, I get to, I, I do it faster. Mm -hmm. And I get into better shape. Mm -hmm. but, but it never failed that even when I was doing it really good, I could still hear my coach in the background. Come on, Tinker, you're, you're on 70. Just a little bit more to go. You're over halfway there. You were almost there. He just kept saying, you're almost there. But there's something that happens to us believers when we're almost there. I want to tell some of you, almost there is not good enough. Almost there is not good enough. Well, God almost did the miracle. Not good enough. Well, God almost brought the financial breakthrough. Not good enough. Not good enough. You're almost there will never compete with something. The city of dreams. You're almost there. will never compete with what God has for you and your destiny. And when he's promised you, somebody help me preach this. Don't give up when you're almost there. I've come by to be your coach this morning. Your spiritual lifeline coach. And I've come by to scream out to some of you in your heart and your spirit. Don't give up. You're almost there. You're almost there. You're almost there.
is where David was crowned the king of Judah, but not the king of Israel. David says, God, do you want me to go take the throne? God says, no, no, no. Suddenly, as you read on, I love it. What happens is, the people of Israel come out to meet David. <laughs> and they say, David, become our king. How many of you know it's easy to be royalty when it's invited and not forced upon you? David waits for that almost there moment. He hears, don't go to Jerusalem again. God is working while we are waiting. Somebody just raise your hand and hear the scripture. Have you not known? Have you not heard? You're tired. You've been waiting a long time for God to do something that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not faint. Amen. Nor is he weary. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives power to the faint and to those who have no might. He increases strength. Even when you shall faint and be weary, young men shall utterly fall. But those, those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You might be sitting here today saying, I've served God a long time. I've got to almost there many times, but never quite made it. I've come by to tell you, restore your strength in the Lord one more time. You're almost there and you haven't quite made it. But hang on. He's right around the corner. Stay with me all over this house. don't want to give up and almost there. The last city of David is this. The city of Zion. The city of dreams. 2 Samuel 5.3 Therefore all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron. And King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David, king over Israel. Yeah. Jerusalem. Zion in the Old Testament, when you look at any Jewish encyclopedia, Zion is this beautiful city. Islam has wanted it for centuries simply because it was this gorgeous city that sits on a hill. It is the highest point geographically. You can see it for miles. Psalms 48, 2, they write about it. Beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth is not Zion on the side of the north, the city of the great king. Zion in, is Jerusalem. In regard to the big inheritance, David inherited the city. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? David didn't just become king. David inherited the city. Oh, somebody help me. David was not Saul's blood. David had no right to the city. But God gave David the city. Amen. You and I have no right to healing. But because of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, and His blood now flows through us, you and I can raise our hands and say, God, heal us in the name of Jesus. You and I have no right to blessings and to favor and to peace and to the power of but because he's grafted us into the vine, we now can walk into Zion declaring, because of whose I am, I can lay in this city. Amen. Don't give up, you're almost there. Don't give up, church, you're almost there. Some of you have been in this church a long time, you've seen a lot change. There's things in life that want us to, they just pull at us, <coughs> try to get us to give up. Well, as I was looking over this today, I was rereading those scriptures, Hebrews 13, 14, for we have no lasting city, but we seek that city which is to come. Mm -hmm. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. Mm -hmm. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. 
Saints of God, we're not at Zion yet. We're not there. Don't give up. Almost there is not good enough. Don't give up. He's working while you're waiting. something. And I'm sure you think, well, somebody could have preached that a little bit better. I'm sure they could have. One thing you can never mistake is my passion, y'all. Because I've been almost dead. I've been a pastor. I've been almost there at that door. I worked, I worked secular jobs. And I prayed for people that I worked with and led them to the Lord. Only to see them almost get there. <laughs> And I don't know who this is for today, but I believe that there is a life-saving power of the Holy Spirit in this room. And you've gotten to almost there. And you still have your hands. And you say, God, this is good enough. Now, see, God, I pray my heart. I've gone way over today. You don't ever have to have me back for the next two, two years. I've preached two years of stuff this morning. I'm getting tired of giving up and almost there. My kid came with me to church today. Oh, so close to giving his life to Jesus. Almost there. I'm tired of almost there. You're looking at a young man that has read about the revivals and has read about the awakenings. And I don't want to die unless I see it. I want to see him show up. But I believe what he's trying to tell his people is that sometimes you've got to follow me on the journey. You've got to hang in there. And somebody in this room, you've been in a few of these places and you've been challenged. You, you thought, it's okay, I'm okay here. I'll just hang out here in the cave until things simmer down, until things calm down. If that's you, I just want you to step out. Pastor, would you come stand with me at the altar as the shepherd of this house? <clears throat> if you've been in one of these places, in one of these cities, and you feel like just, God, where are you? I want you to step out today. I just want to pray a prayer of agreement with you that God will continue to keep you plowing. Come on, do it in Jesus' name. You know who you are. I'm not leaving. God said goodbye for somebody this morning. Somebody in this place, you, you've gotten to give me a, you thought, I, I'm at the throne, I, I'm here now, this is, this is good enough. I, you, you've ended up at the cave, and you thought, God, everything's, everything's dark, God, everything's falling around me, Lord. You must not have been in it. You must not have spoken that word. Maybe you're going through some cities with your family. Why don't you step out and let me pray with you? Sister Rowdy, go ahead and sing us something. Father, in the name of Jesus, touch this place today. Come on, if you're going through something, we just want to pray with you and ask God to move in your life.
If you've got faith in your heart and you want to help us pray, would you come and pray with us today and ask God to touch these at this altar? God, touch my sister today. Touch my brother today.